so you can check with the same amounts that you have uh, joined to find out what's going on north uh, to our partners and um, colleagues north of the border in Canada uh, talking about their mandatory e-learning in Ontario. And we have some people here that are going to share uh, that information plus information from uh, Michigan Virtual. And I am from Michigan, so I know. Well, I'm so proud to see you guys here um, join in that conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Randy. Thanks. Um, are you okay if, if I don't use the mic? Because I use my gym voice. Still in that thousand student gymnasium. I still remember that. Um, anyway, so for those of you that just joined, Randy Labonte from Canadian eLearning Network. Can you learn? Uh, we just went through a little bit of a roundup before. And so this is a specific focus on mandatory e-learning, which was announced uh, in Ontario. But the first thing that we did, because we don't know what the specifics are, we went to Michigan Virtual and said, help, you've got some experience with this, come and inform us, help inform the dialogue and make sure it stays a bit more centered to actual pedagogy and practice as opposed to power and politics, which is what it started on. So we welcome that. So we're gonna hear a lot more because they've got the experience base, but we'll give you a bit of the chaos right now in what's happening. And then Michael will chime in with a lot more about the balanced perspective and sort of what that means in terms of what's happening. So uh, almost a year ago, uh, there was an announcement made I don't know if anyone really knew, and, and Michael would type, type in from there if there's anything else, but uh, essentially four mandatory e-learning courses. So this is a conservative government that was elected, um, and of course the conservative governments are not well received by a lot of the labor groups, uh, and was not well received, nor was this announcement, by the teachers groups. So the mandatory e-learning, without any description whatsoever of what it meant uh, and what they were asking or going to do, the announcement just basically said, this is to better prepare students for the future. Digital schools are essential, and it's to help them advance and enter into the workplace. Well, that sounds great, but how is that going to happen? Were the questions. No other Canadian province has experience with this, nor are there any mandatory requirements. I know that for those folks that are still from BC, a lot of the BC schools, which had rich involvement, went to one mandatory course in grade 10, and they put it online as an online course. They did not require students to take it, but they found it was easier to timetable students into that as an online course. So it was done for expeditious reasons or money saving or logistical reasons. So there really hasn't been. So we looked to Michigan for a lot of that, and I'll let you folks talk a little bit about that. But nowhere was there a four course requirement. And that was what was announced. It was since back, back down with resistance from the teachers unions to two required courses. So we talked a little bit before about uh, the existing e-learning system. And I use this in my Pecha Kucha, but really e-learning is not that classroom with a teacher at the center, although most people assume that from the paradigms that we have from what we know about education and what we learn from. So in essence, what happens in a robust e-learning system, which is now uh, in the design, there's a school mentor, a parent that's behind the students and other students that are supporting in the actual learning. So it's not one teacher with 30 in a room, it's one teacher centrally and probably using course materials and content that was created by a different teacher or educator or was purchased. So they're not even creating the curriculum. Like when I was teaching, I have to make up my day plan every single day and I have to figure it out. I have to go, sometimes I would have a textbook, great, but you can't teach the textbook. So I became, the, everybody know what that is? You don't know what that is? Gestetner. You used to hand crank the Gestetner to make uh, copies of multiple worksheets on paper. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> um, so, so it's a different model and it's a different paradigm. But all of the language, the written contractual language, the written policies, and as Michael Kenwell said earlier, even the bureaucracy believes it's just that single solitary classroom with one teacher in it. So it, it really doesn't fit well. And so when we talk about 
uh, you know, ramping up an education system to have mandatory courses, what does that really mean? Well, look at the people that are involved. You're duplicating, you're ramping, you're scaling that up. It's not just one. These, these uh, programs have evolved to this point and they involve a teacher, student, facilitator, parent, there's an administrator, there's an IT person that manages that. And then there's that team maybe of curriculum design and, and, and content creators that are part of that whole thing. So when you're gonna scale up, you gotta scale it all up, or you're gonna lapse back to what was currently or pre previously the model, which was just, um, Crawford Killian was a, a, uh, an instructor at a college. And when I first got into this back in, 1900, uh, 1990s, 1990s. I'm not at all. Um, he used the term shovelware. So when online programs first started, he called it shovelware. Just toss your text into a PDF, stick it in their face, make them send something back and mark it. So the models now around e-learning are very different. They're becoming much more rich and robust in terms of their involvement and support. Even in rural areas, even with adults, We've gone in and we've uh, observed many different classes, but there's a local facilitator that manages the connection, supports the student when they come in. Yes, their teacher is online, but they've got the infrastructure there. And I know with HCOPS, you've got local facilitator support help that is in uh, a lot of the work that you're doing, uh, and I've seen it firsthand in terms of going around to the schools. In Ontario, now that's mandatory, they already have very successful models. So Cavanfo for uh, the you know, Franco, Franco Ontarians uh, have basically 96% of the students finish when they, they enroll. Now, yes, there's some gatekeeping that goes on with that. Yes, there's some motivation because it's usually to get graduate credit, uh, et cetera. But Ontario eLearning Consortium as well has tracked that and they find a 90, about a 92% completion rate for the students that enter the programs. Yes, they're supported. Yes, it's very structured, um, and but there is success. Now, what's gonna happen when you try to build that up tenfold? Well, the model, is it gonna be able to accommodate that? Now, the other thing is that in terms of Ontario's language, it says specifically that e-learning courses will comply with the class size maximums. Now, with the Ontario government also announced an increase to secondary school class sizes, which again were resisted and they dropped back uh, in terms of their numbers to a certain extent, but nothing has changed and wavered from the fact that where it was 22 before the match for a lot of the secondary schools, it's now the proposal is to increase it to 35. So um, yeah, and I think there's some other comparisons that for the most part, the gauge and guide was what was typically the, the caseload for the teacher in a regular, Structured brick and mortar school is what was there and online. I don't, do you have anything to add to that, Michael? You want to just feel free to jump in. No, you're doing uh, fine. But there's a body of research that says every time that the class size of e learning goes up, student performance goes way down. So, what do you think is going to happen in Ontario if they scale up to having each required now two mandatory e learning courses? So there, there lies some of the concern and the issues. Um, and I, we entered into some of the, the, the online discussions just to clarify that a lot of people were saying that e-learning is at fault, it's to blame, it's terrible, it's a poor choice, no one's successful, look at this research, that they, what the data says, well it doesn't say that. It's the structure and the design and the delivery and support you know, what the critical factors are, and if those elements are not part of it, yes, you're gonna have an unsuccessful program. But e-learning, again, is like, like that one-room schoolhouse notion. Uh, it conjures up certain models of things and experience, but not everyone has had the similar experience through and, and the richness of it. Um, so in Ontario, they're scaling 10 to 20 times. 65,000 students are currently involved, but 10% were engaged in e-learning courses. So they, you, you multiply by two, there's, 600,000 secondary students, there's gonna be 12, you know, 1.2 million course enrollments to meet that, okay? So, or an increase of 300,000 course enrollments per year to meet that mandate. So, interesting. Um, not to mention the physical space, because guaranteed access means you have to build physical spaces in the classrooms for that. The connectivity in terms of uh, both uh, in rural areas as well as others. 
Uh, and then the increase in terms of the training for teachers and the number of teachers that are there, it's just, it just kind of goes. If, if you're going to keep this model intact, it's going to be very difficult to, to go beyond that. So the questions that we're left with in Ontario, what's more central, what does more centralized mean? Okay, no one's defined that in the government. And how are students going to be uh, skilled up to also be successful in that? And teachers. And where are you going to get this, the onboarding for pre-service teachers to come in for that? And there's issues around rural access for many of the students in terms of their ability to engage, the technology that's required. And not to mention, if 10% of your students are taking an online course, who's supervising them <laughs> and how? And then, of course, special needs students. So it's very unclear exactly what's going to happen. And as a result, there's a pushback in the media. We don't know where this is gonna land. It's at the bargaining table. Teachers are on strike, uh, from rotating strikes now in protest of all of this. And there could be modifications at the table. So what we're talking about or speculating may just never happen. So um, we put that together in a journal article. And I'm going to toss this back over to you now, Michael, to add some commentary or poke some questions or just bring your wise voice here. I've got nothing to add. I think you did a great job, Randy, unless folks have questions in the room. Okay, not seeing any questions uh, for that. The, all of the information and the links to the article are part of in the, the ELAC app uh, as well. So uh, they're there, but I would like to maybe, let's just hesitate for a minute. There's a couple more slides about mandatory e-learning in the US as well, uh, Michael, that maybe you could, you could share with folks a little bit as we segue in to, uh, to Justin and Andrea. Sure. Um, so as you, um, I guess if folks in the room are from the U.S., as you may know, there are five states that actually require an online learning as part of a graduation requirement. And then there's one state uh, which isn't listed there, which is New Mexico, that requires a online advanced placement, dual credit, and I'm missing some category. But essentially, you've got to do a course that falls into one of those four categories. Uh, the five that do have online learning requirements, um, you can see them listed there and the dates in which they were brought in. The interesting thing is that while on face values, they will say like it's one online course, I guess with the exception of Michigan and Al Alabama, where they talk about an experience. The only one that when that actually gets operationalized that requires a specific online course is actually Florida. All of the other jurisdictions, the way in which the online learning requirement has been operationalized, it can be really taken care of with what most of us would determine or describe as blended learning. So the embedding a technology infused learning experience in all of the Michigan merit curriculum courses, which is one of the three ways in which Michigan can, a uh, student in Michigan can fulfill their requirement um, is essentially a blended learning experience. In the case of uh, Arkansas, the way in which they, and Alabama, the way in which they describe uh, blended or digital learning is the term they use, encompasses blended learning. Many of these states have a option where students who have an IEP can be exempted from the online learning experience. So when we look at this idea that all students have to have an online course in order to graduate, it's actually a little bit misleading uh, compared to what actually the, how each of these things have become operationalized. So I'm not sure if you've got other slides there or not, Randy, but oh, I'm going to say probably not. Oh, there's a summary of what I was just talking about. Um, we only included four there. The, the reason we only included those four was because those are the four that are have been specifically mentioned by the Ontario government to date. So the only one that they haven't mentioned of the five that have a requirement is Virginia. I don't know why they haven't mentioned Virginia. It's such a lovely place. Um, what's the tagline for Virginia? Virginia is for lovers. I think that's just the tourism slogan. Um, but they're not getting any love from Ontario right now. So. Okay, so that's the end of that part. Sorry, I had to swap out um, 
microphones for <laughs> here. So you're back now to the webcam, not the sure mic that picks up better. So you might not hear quite as well. Um, okay, so any questions of Michael in terms of what we've done here before we switch it over to the group that's had the most experience with this? We had uh, Joe Friedhoff from Michigan Virtual come up to a leadership summit in August as well to help inform the dialogue. And Joe has also uh, done some publications and responded to media in Ontario uh, on, uh, as part of that follow-up. So what we've noted is we have a much better balanced uh, conversation and dialogue going on in, uh, in, in, in the media. So that it's, we were really most upset and concerned because it was mainstream teachers throwing their colleagues who were e-teachers kind of under the bus. So they were very quiet and silent in a lot of this. They weren't coming out to take an effective voice because it's politically charged no one knows what the government's going to do. So we stepped up as Canny Learn to be a part of that um, as, as we did. So, and I'm hoping, Michael, you're still seeing the slide deck, are you? No? Okay, perfect. So let's go into, I'm just going to move some. Unfortunately, the one thing that Zoom does is overwrites over top of your other. There we go, present. And we'll just try and put this down to the side. It went into full screen mode. Do you know how to take it out of full screen mode or? Uh, just hit escape. Yeah, but then it's not gonna be strong enough. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of these. Oh, yep, yeah. okay. We can just get them all down. There you go. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll come up and change the slides. It doesn't seem to be working. Uh, oh, you know what, because I was in Zoom. Hang on a sec. Oh, yep, yeah. yep, yeah, it'll work. It'll work now. Oh, cool. Because I was in the Zoom window. Thank you. Okay. So, hi, everyone. My name is Justin Bruno. Uh, I work at Michigan Virtual. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what Michigan Virtual is and what we do. Um, my title is Research and Innovation Manager. So, I work um, space, kind of specifically in research and development. I'm trying to think about how we can offer different services and experience for uh, K 12 learners as well as professional learners. Um, and I also have worked previously in kind of like a research and policy position in Michigan Virtual. So that's a little bit of what I'll talk about in terms of how the policy landscape shaped online learning in Michigan specifically and a lot of the research that we've been able to collect on online learning that can hopefully shape uh, the practices that happen in Canada going forward. Hi, I'm Andrea McKay. I also work for Michigan Virtual as their Administrator of Instructional Leadership. So what that means is that I support our teachers who teach full-time online. We have about 25 teachers who teach fully online with us. Um, and then we have about 160 teachers who teach part-time online with us. So they are most likely working in a face-to-face -face school or a traditional school, but um, are working with us as kind of their side gig and um, get to experience both sides of teaching in that way. Not working? <laughs> oh, hang on. I probably went back into a Zoom window. There you go. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about Michigan Virtual. We've been around for um, 21 years now. Uh, we're a state funded nonprofit, so we do receive state funding. Um, and we are also, um, uh, we also receive some uh, funds through the sale of our K-12 courses and as well as some of the services that we provide for different educational organizations that we work with. Um, I think I mentioned this in the last session, some of you guys were here, I think we've done around 30,000 student uh, enrollments, K-12 student enrollments last year, about 70,000 professional, uh, professional learning enrollments in our professional learning portal. Um, and then we also um, just do a lot of different design work with a lot of different partners now. So, um, trying to actually help them bring their own online learning experiences uh, out into the world and helping them actually provide but through, through the provision of instructional design services. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of like the policy and research that we put together and Andrea can really talk more about um, kind of like the actual experiences that students uh, have and teachers have uh, whenever they are learning online. So this is a nice infographic from a report that we do every year called our effectiveness report. Um, this is something we're required by the legislature to do as part of uh, the state funding that we receive. And um, 
we, I think, are probably a leader in the U.S. in terms of like the amount and the transparency of data that we collect around online learning in terms of the state of Michigan. And so we're really fortunate to have this data set and be able to use it to kind of drive our activity on a year-to-year -year basis and on what we do around online learning. Um, basically, when a, when a, when a, um, when a teacher is um, uploading data into the teacher student data link system in Michigan, they have to identify the delivery method of the course that was taught or that was taken by the student. And if that course was determined to be online, they have to mark the delivery method as virtual. So we're really relying on like the input of the data by the teachers to tell us whether or not a student took that course online. So that's how we get this data. Um, last year, we knew that about 112,000 uh, courses were students took courses uh, that were deemed to be virtual or delivered virtually uh, and that accounted for about 7% of Michigan public school students and that also accounted for 581,000 individual enrollments in a course what we call a virtual course um, and we saw representation from two-thirds of Michigan public school districts um, the breakdown of the virtual enrollments by type you can see there um, Michigan virtual actually only accounts for a small amount of the total virtual enrollments across the state. So that's something that of note for us, but because we're state funded, um, we are trying to actually kind of proselytize about best practices, promising practices around online learning so we can help bring completion rates up uh, for those who are using virtual learning and not coming to Michigan virtual for that, for those services. 78% um, of the virtual enrollments came from grades nine through 12. Um, we uh, know that 66% of those enrollments were from students in poverty and that uh, the statewide virtual pass rate was 55%. Uh, the Michigan virtual pass rate was about 84%, 85%, um, but we know we're working with a, a vastly different population uh, in terms of the students that take Michigan virtual courses. There's a number of different factors that go into that. Um, but Again, being state funded, we're trying to drive that 55% number um, by sharing best practices and coming in, talking about some of the work that we're doing, and you'll see that kind of reflected in the rest of the presentation. So a couple of different policies that have driven online learning in Michigan. Uh, Michael mentioned the 2006 online learning experience requirement. That's part of the Michigan Merit curriculum. It's basically the required courses that a student has to take in high school to uh, graduate. Um, and then in 2013, we saw Section 21F of the State School Aid Act passed, which um, was a course choice law, basically allowing students to take courses online if they chose to do so. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those policies and kind of how they impacted what we're seeing across the state. So the Michigan Merit Curriculum, general breakdown of what a student needs uh, in terms of graduation requirements. You can see kind of the usual suspects in terms of subject areas there, but um, like Michael mentioned, we're also seeing that online learning experience, and it is um, actually, there's a rationale provided for why this is required for students, which is pretty helpful. Um, basically, implemented to give students the knowledge and skills to succeed in the 21st century and drive Michigan's economic success in the global economy. Um, the online learning experience is not, um, like Michael also mentioned, is not meant to be enrollment in a course. It can be an online learning experience, broadly defined, right? can interact with an online learning um, assessment or an online learning unit in a, in, a, in a classroom. It's a blended classroom setup. So there's a number of different things that can be used to fulfill this requirement. Um, the other thing to note is that there is no way that the state actually validates whether or not the student uh, partook in this online learning experience. Um, it's not marked on a student's transcript in any way for graduation. It's just something that kind of guides the way things go. Um, I, prior to coming to Michigan Virtual, I was a building teacher, social studies teacher, uh, 15 years, and I was one of the teachers that our counselors would come to and say um, after 2006, it looks like you do a lot online with your students. We would like to have you track those hours so that we can say that they are meeting that <laughs> you know, the requirement for graduation, but um, yeah, very loose in terms of how that was defined. Um, I'm not sure if it keeps kids from graduating, but uh, the, the goal was there to, to start tracking those hours. So I mentioned um, broadly defined, you can really fulfill this requirement through three different ways. You can actually take a fully online course, you can participate in quote unquote online experience, or you can actually have online components woven into um, a course that you're taking face to face at a high school. 
Um, a little bit more of the language here, integrated online experiences should be enough to develop competency for virtual, for, for learning in a virtual environment. So the, the basic idea is that we're trying to get students competent to learn online, not necessarily that we're trying to use online as a modality to drive content knowledge or, or, or instruction. We really just want to see students be able to learn online. I think that's an important distinction. Um, I won't go too much into to the Michigan American curriculum, but if anybody has questions on that, there, there are a number of bills introduced in the legislature every year uh, in terms of trying to modify the Michigan American curriculum. Um, people have a lot of different issues with the lack of flexibility with the MMC, but um, the online learning experience has been a constant now since 2006. Um, so I mentioned in uh, 2013, um, 21F was passed, and this is our course choice law, which allowed students to choose to enroll in two, up to two courses uh, per academic term. Um, and the, the policy has kind of broadened since then in terms of being able to enroll in more than two, uh, to have more of a discussion about enrollment in more than two courses. Um, the, 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 the kind of word for, for that choice is basically um, that you, that a district has specific reasons they can deny enrollment, um, they can't really cap a number per se, right? They, the students can enroll in as many as they want, but if a district were to deny the enrollment uh, for that student, they'd have to provide in writing the reason for that denial. They would have to align with language that's actually spelled out in the law. So just some general definitions. There's a lot of definitions in 21F because trying to, I think, ensure a lot of quality, um, uh, quality standards and quality control in the process. Um, no, kind of, I don't know if it's really all that worth spending a ton of time in, in these definitions, but I think one of the more important pieces is the actual definition of a virtual course here. So um, that has to be capable of generating credit or a grade. It's provided an interactive learning environment. The majority of the content is delivered using the internet and um, it has to be able to deliver instruction to students who are separated from either their, or sorry, from their instructor or teacher of record by time, location, and both. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a virtual learning course. So I mentioned those reasons for denial. If a student is denied enrollment in one of those courses, um, it has to be documented, it has to fall under one of these areas. So um, you can deny an enrollment on the basis of um, grade level. If a student is in K grades K through five, you can deny that enrollment, but it doesn't prevent them from enrolling if they are in grades K through five. Um, if they previously gained credit in that course, if the virtual course is incapable of generating academic credit, so it doesn't meet the definition of a virtual course, or if it's not consistent with the student's remaining graduation requirements or career interests. And that's probably a counselor question, right? In terms of where that student is and what they're trying to do on, on track for graduation. Um, the student's not completed the prerequisite coursework for their requested work for the requested virtual course. So if you've not done algebra one and you want to take an algebra two course, does that make a ton of sense? Probably not. Students failed a previous virtual course in the same subject, or the cost of the virtual course is more than 6.67% of the district's minimum foundation allowance per people. So it's a little bit wonky, I won't get into none of that, but trying to control costs. Um, some more reasons for denial. I don't want to read the slide, but it's there for you if you want to know more about that. If a student is denied an enrollment, there's actually an appeal process. So if the student and the parent want to actually enroll, um, they can go through an appeal process and appeal that to the intermediate school district, which uh, has constituent districts underneath it. And so that process can kind of be borne out that way. And, um, any kind of denial has to be submitted in writing, so everything's on record for folks as well. So for, for those who are providing virtual courses like Michigan Virtual um, or even other districts in the state who are providing um, um, courses for, for, for students, um, they, have, they have to ensure that the courses are published in the primary district's catalog of board approved courses. So um, that there's a little bit more quality control there so we actually know what's being offered. We can um, see what, have a level of visibil visibility around um, the online learning in the state. Um, we have to assign it to each student the teacher of record and provide the teacher's personal ID code, so that's for evaluation purposes. Um, and they have to offer the virtual course on either open entry, open exit, or align to semester, trimester, or accelerated academic format. You also have to provide a syllabus if you're providing a course under 21F. So um, we actually have 
there are specific elements of the syllabus that have to be um, identified so you can so we again know what sort of content is being provided to that student um, and what standards that it's aligned to um, and then and uh, districts or anyone who's providing a course has to provide up to the state an aggregated count of the enrollments and the number of enrollments in which a student earns 60 percent more basically how many students pass those courses that were offered so I mentioned those syllabi have to be submitted into a statewide catalog. Michigan Virtual manages the statewide catalog of online courses in the state. So it's not just Michigan Virtual courses. It's any course in the state of Michigan that's offered under this course choice law has to be listed in this catalog. Um, and you can see the different information about the course. So there's a high level of visibil visibility and transparency for parents uh, and students before deciding to enroll in a course that way. Um, and the goal is to kind of get them as much information up front as possible before making that decision to enroll. Um, another, some other elements that are required, expectations for actual contact time between an instructor and a student, and the academic supports that are available, and the learning outcomes or objectives, uh, the name of the institution, organization providing the content. So um, let's say you're a school district, but you purchase content or you purchase courses from a vendor. You have every right to do that, but you have to identify who the vendor is that you're purchasing that content from. And so if districts or parents have preferences for different vendors, uh, they can actually see where that content, where that instruction is coming from. Same for instruction, not just content. We have to have the course sched codes, the number of eligible students that will be provided, and um, ultimately all the results have to be reported back to us as well. So we actually have completion data for every course that's offered in the catalog. So you can see how well students are doing in those courses. Um, the courses have to be taught by a teacher of record, so we have to have a valid Michigan teacher certificate, if applicable, um, endorsing the specific subject area for which they're teaching, um, and providing responsible, uh, and they're responsible for providing instruction, determining instructional methods. Um, do you want to talk more about teachers? Why you think some of that stuff might be necessary? How it's helpful for a teacher? being uh, a full-time, former full-time online instructor and managing them now? Yeah. Um, well, for a lot of reasons, it's important to have a teacher who is highly qualified and, and highly uh, certified in, in with the Michigan Teaching Certificate. Um, our teachers also undergo uh, annual evaluations that by state law um, allow them to maintain their certification. And they also have to be um, evaluated by certified administrators. So we are certified administrators who do their evaluations in the classroom. Um, it's, it's just really important, I think, for our schools and, and, and partners throughout the state to know what they're getting into with a Michigan virtual course. Um, they are receiving a teacher who is, is certified in that area and knows the content and is a subject matter expert. Is there any specific training for the online environment? For our teachers, yes. I'm, I'm not sure what schools do, um, if they have their own programs, their own virtual programs. So there going. isn't a requirement, like the other requirements. In for schools across the state, no. Okay. <laughs> but for our teachers at Michigan Virtual, they do a, it's about a four week onboarding experience to, to teach with us. Um, as well as, you know, they're, they go through a rigorous interview process and um, we select really wonderful candidates and, and they perform beautifully. <laughs> if I can respond to the others, um, I believe in Michigan, there's an organization and Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the Ramsey Association many years ago in Michigan purchased content um, through a grant to train teachers um, in the schools in terms of getting preparation. And I believe that training is continued through the Ramsey Association to train teachers that are at the local schools. And I believe that content is still being used and managed through the Ramsey Association. I might have been one of those teachers who was trained in that system years ago. And, that, um, and it, that really did kind of get me kicked off and, and moving, moving through. Um, I think it depends on, on what the school's focus is and, and how they're able to deliver what, what they have. Uh, I know some schools using different vendors have um, 
teachers nearby to, for students to report to and, and, and talk to, but they're not the ones actually running the online class. It's really there's there's a requirement in, in Michigan that, like was said, that you have to have a certified teacher attached to that student. Um, but if they're purchasing from another vendor, um, that teacher becomes the teacher of record, and they're actually coaching that student along the work in content on, in concert with uh, the teacher that is uh, provided through the vendor. So I would argue this is maybe one of the most beneficial policy aspects of um, like the online learning landscape in Michigan. Um, students who are taking a course under this course choice law are required to be assigned a mentor. So they have a teacher of record, the person that we just went over that has to have a number of different qualifications to deliver the instruction. Um, but they also have to have somebody who serves as kind of like the eyes and the ears for that uh, teacher of record, that person that doesn't get to interact with them on a, on a daily basis, especially in an asynchronous course, obviously. But these are typically folks who work in a school district. Um, if the student is taking a course like su and supplementing their, their course load with an online course, um, the basic requirements for this position are pretty minimal. You basically just have to be a professional employee of the district, um, but their role is incredibly pivotal, I would argue. Um, the general expectations are, are that they monitor the student's progress, they ensure access to technology and assist students. They're basically providing all of the non-content support um, for that student. They're motivating them, they're helping them track their growth, their progress. Um, we have interviewed a ton of mentors all across the state to just understand this position because it, it's almost like a shadow workforce in a way. Um, there isn't a ton of like knowledge about who these people are and what they do. It's typically another duty that they're assigned uh, at their school building. They might be a parapro or a media center, um, uh, media center specialist. So um, we've been trying to amass as much knowledge about these folks and deliver PD for them and offer them networking opportunities as much as we can because we do think they're a critical role for the student's success. Um, and if I can reiterate on that, when we first started with the online programs, that was key because in one of the key things um, that was very important is the involvement of counselors because the counselors were working with, with students, you know, getting them enrolled in, into courses. But the counselors didn't want that added duty. And so, you know, you had to pull them you know, screaming and, and hollering sometimes into that situation. But a group that really stepped up to the plate with the library media specialists. And so a number of those library media specialists then stepped up and became the mentors where they would actually have banks of computers in their, um, set up in their um, library media center where the students could come and actually take courses, you know, during uh, the day. But we did find out in terms of early research in and you validated it, that the mentor is so key because those kids need that additional assistance and guidance and stay on track, especially if you're, um, you've struggled anyway, but then if you end up being a sixth or seventh grader, you know, that are taking, you know, some of the courses, you need that added element. And so that mentoring became, like Justin said, pivotal, pivotal to the, um, uh, success of those students. There's a direct correlation and then those students that don't have um, a really engaged mentor will fall off the track. Just a comment is that I've seen a lot of that sort of mentor model work, but it's not required. It is required yes. in Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think one of three yes. or four states, maybe I know Alabama has a mentor requirement as well. Sorry, did you want to add something, Andrew? Um, it is required, and again, districts handle it so differently when it, it comes to who they put in that position. Um, and because of that, one of the things that we have, have recognized and, and see a need for is um, somebody on our staff to be able to uh, reach out to mentors. So we actually have an outreach coordinator for mentors who's made a huge difference in the activity that we see in our courses and the success of students as well. So um, she regularly connects with schools around the state who all have very different needs and um, helps them determine best practices for mentoring their students. I would, I would say if you um, currently work with someone who serves in a position like this, or you're thinking about um, starting that in a program or scaling that up in any way, check out a lot of the resources that we've developed for mentors or about mentors. Um, we have sample job descriptions, we have research reports about their impact on success. 
Um, we have a ton of stuff about mentors, and I would highly suggest checking that out on our website. So um, I don't know how much time we have. I'm going to buzz through five minutes. Okay. I'm going to buzz through just eight really quick lessons from Michigan. I think if, if you're talking about how policy in terms of mandatory online learning can um, be looked at in terms of Michigan from an example standpoint. So focus on the opportunity, um, not necessarily the requirement, right? Um, this is an actual opportunity. It's not necessarily something that's being forced upon people in terms of compliance. There's hopefully some good reason that can be found <laughs> in, a, in a compliance policy like that. Um, and so um, Randy can obviously talk a lot more about like where the opportunity would lie in terms of the context in Canada. But um, if, you're, are, if you are having those conversations with folks, it's, it's important to have a, a message about opportunity. Um, the way we look at it, um, whenever we actually try to work with folks who counsel students into online courses. Uh, we developed this online learner readiness rubric, so we kind of try to understand how ready that student might be for an online learning experience. And we have them kind of self-assess across a few different domains, including tech skill, learning style, interest in connectivity, um, support services, so what you might call like soft skills in a lot of ways, um, because we know it's a totally different learning modality and there's a lot of different skills that are needed to be successful there. Um, invest in supports. So we know that we kind of rely on this triangle of supports here, mentors, parents, and the online instructor. I think this gets at the kind of diagrams that Randy was showing earlier. Um, it's, you, I think you're already losing if you are a district or a program that is investing in online learning to save money. Um, whatever money that you think is going to be saved, uh, you need to invest that back into supports for those students because otherwise it's just not going to be successful. And I think our statewide data bears that out in a lot of ways. I can't speak to the motivation of a lot of those districts or programs, um, but I can say that um, if it is being used in that way, it's not resulting in, in student success, unfortunately. Um, build confidence through the catalog. So this is an example of the statewide catalog that I was mentioning earlier. You can kind of see just how visible all that information is. I mentioned the pass rates, the enrollment counts for every course. Um, so it's, if you can build, um, uh, confidence and transparency and visibility um, with um, people who actually know that this is uh, an opportunity for folks and that there are a certain level of quality controls around them, um, then I think it would be met with a lot less resistance. Um, uh, another um, kind of important component is that a course offered under a course choice law has to be aligned to uh, online learning standards, so course quality standards. Um, you can actually see the results of the review of every course in the catalog against those standards and whether a standard was fully partially or not met. So um, that I think is pretty important as well. Um, play to your strengths. So if you're working with students um, who you know will need to take online courses, think about what might be of interest to them, wh where they might be successful. Um, we, uh, I think, is this from our data? I would just say that um, oftentimes we find students who are put into online classes because they were unsuccessful in a face-to-face -face classroom, and that does not mean that they will be successful in an online classroom. So think about where their strengths are and encourage them to grow in those areas. Start with less. So I, I, I would have thought this would have been common sense, uh, <laughs> but um, I think if you kind of ramp up the experience with students, having them take fewer virtual experiences or virtual courses at one time. Um, the data pretty clearly shows that it is important to do that because you are, have a higher chance of success if students are taking fewer, uh, at least at the outset. So you can see the completion rates for students who are taking one to two, three to four, or five or more virtual courses, and that is a negative trend line. Um, monitor effectiveness. So we're really fortunate that we get state funding to produce this report. I highly encourage folks to check this out. And if you're able, if you have access to big data sets um, or even small data sets, if you're talking about a smaller entity than a state, to be able to try to compile something like this, you can tell a compelling story about what's happening uh, with online learning. Spread best practices. So. Um, Michigan Virtual also produces a ton of different resources. Like I mentioned, we have um, we have guides to online learning for every persona you can think of. Um, the student guide, a parent guide, a mentor guide, a teacher guide, an administrator guide, and a school board guide. So everybody who's involved in terms of the online learning decisions uh, around a, an online learning program, we have kind of provided some um, a 
compilation of promising practices and kind of understanding what online learning would mean to that persona. So we're highly checking all those out, totally free and available online. Um, this is our 20 minute toolkit for districts who actually want to implement um, a course choice program in their own district. So we provide that at no cost as well. Um, and then just make sure that you're monitoring the effectiveness so you can update the policies. If you have any kind of leverage with uh, policymakers where you are, you can provide uh, hopefully a compelling story to them and let them know um, how things are going and whether or not they can change policies as they go. 21F has actually been updated four times since its passage in 2013. So I think that's pretty encouraging because we're able to have a, an ongoing dialogue with the legislature about how successful or unsuccessful it might be in some areas. Um, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? That's great. I really appreciate that because it, we're hopefully the experiences that Michigan has gone through inform what happens in Ontario. We're not certain as yet whether anyone's listening uh, necessarily, uh, but certainly that has, has certainly helped. But the, the, the requirement for mentorship, the openness in terms of being there, but also the policy and legislation that's, that's supporting that. So I know that there's the applicability of some of those lessons are really important across all of Canada when I start to think in terms of the changes that are going on and, and uh, having Michigan available and also those resources available is really, really critical. So we really want to thank you for your connection, support, and this particular part of this session as well. So appreciate it very much. Thank you. Are there any general questions from the group? It is four o'clock almost and it is the reception at 4.30. And after a long, busy day. Thank you for your audience. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Thanks very much. That's great. No, thank you. That was awesome. Of course. And Michael, uh, Michael, are you still there? <laughs> it's nice to meet nice you. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah, any other. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Thanks for sticking it out. Anything you want to say? Yeah. No, I'm good. Okay, appreciate you being there. Thanks very much. And, uh, Not a problem.